Roy Crown from Revelation Trust and welcome to another series of Gospel Entrepreneurs. In this podcast, we'll speak to entrepreneurial leaders in the church, community and business who are finding new ways to expand the kingdom. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Paul Cowley, MBE, the Reverend Paul Cowley, formerly the pioneer of Prison Alpha. I spoke to him on the first day in a new job as Director of Rehabilitation at the supermarket chain Iceland. He tells me his incredible story about showing God's love to prisoners previous through Alpha and in the local church. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Roy. It's great to be here. And you're, you're calling me from a hotel room in Chester, is that right? I am indeed on a phone. <laughs> so we could move straight into the job you're now doing, but tell us, you came to faith and it was a dramatic moment in your life. Give us a bit of that story so people that don't know you, Paul, have got something of the Paul Cowley story. So born in Manchester, raised in Salford, both my parents uh, were from Liverpool, um, both alcoholics, both atheists, very tight family, my dad, my mum and me, that was it, no brothers or sisters. So growing up in a, you know, with two parents or alcoholics, it gets kind of tricky at times, as I'm sure your listeners will, will understand. So at 15, two things happened, really. I was expelled from my school, which was a comprehensive in Manchester, which was a nightmare, really. I, I hated it. I was bullied a lot at school. It was just awful. At the same time that happened, my father came home in a drunken stupor. We had a big argument, and, uh, and he threw me out, basically. So I was on the streets for a while at uh, the age of 16. Then got involved in a gang, lived in a squat for a while in a place called Stockport, got in trouble with the police. Ended up going to prison and then uh, came out of there, terrified of going back in again and scared. So I kept myself to myself and then got a break, really, and joined the army at the age of 21, which saved my life, really, physically. But morally, I was completely bankrupt. So I went through two marriages, two divorces, drank too much, became a little bit like my father, really, just had no sort of moral guidance at all the only stable thing i had roy really was my military career which which went really well i did two tours in northern ireland the, the falklands five different regiments ended up in the army physical training corps as a pt instructor and then resigned from there because basically i was fed up um and then a few things happened really that uh, never really interested in god so an atheist really not a god hater but an atheist not not interested in that stuff Long story short, I got in touch or my mother got in touch with me and she was quite a character. When I left home at 16, my parents divorced and married a couple of times really each and never really saw each other again. My mother got in touch with me through, through the military, got to see her. Sadly, she, she died. And when I was moving all her stuff, I found a Bible. And in the Bible was, was pictures of me as a kid, which was uh, a bit upsetting because we hadn't spoken for years and years. And lots of highlighted pieces of scripture, which I didn't know about then. And a phone number in the back. So I phoned this number and it was Manchester. And I basically said, who are you? How do you know my mother? And what are you doing in this Bible? So what came back from that was, was a real shock. This woman on the end of the phone said to me, um, all that Bible you've got was given to, to your mother, Brenda, when she was baptised. I said, baptised? My mother? She said, oh, yes, yeah, she's been a member of our church for about two years, and that was a baptism present. And you must be Paul, who she talks about. I was a bit bowled over by the whole conversation, and I said, well, my mother's dead now, thank you very much, and I hung up. That must have been emotional, and though, Paul. It was really emotional. My mum and dad was as far away from the church as anyone or your listeners could, could possibly imagine. But I couldn't get this idea of my mother being a Christian. So I went on a bit of a sort of um, a journey and did an alpha course. And I thought, you know, 17 years in the military, I've done a lot of courses. I'll, I'll do one on God and I'll basically find out what happened to my mum. And halfway through the course, to cut a long story short, I thought, oh, my goodness, you know, this stuff, this stuff could be true. And if it's true, I need to make some serious decisions. And it was there that it kind of 
all the rational stuff went from my head and hit my heart. And I remember just dropping to my knees in a corner on my own and sobbing, n not knowing why, not, not being a man of tears, really, before that happened. And then a couple of people came over and prayed for me, and that's when I gave my life to Christ. So, you know, I met with Christ, but I wasn't really looking for him. And then I just got completely overwhelmed by this unconditional love that he would love someone like me. I never thought I was lovable or or anything like that. So, yeah, it was it was a bit dramatic, actually. <laughs> a bit dramatic <laughs> is a bit of an understatement there, Paul. And, and then as a result of that, to cut a long story short, you ended up becoming a vicar. So just before I became a vicar, I was running health clubs. I left the army, uh, trained as a physical training instructor, became a general manager of a club, started going to church. And then Emmy Wilson was on staff at, at HTB, been there a long time, invited me on a prison visit. And again, it was on that visit that I got hit right between the eyes and felt the Lord say to me, I've got a job for you and I'll, I'll let you know what it is. But, but that was it. So again, I became discontented with my, my job and my general manager of this fancy health club and went on more prison visits. And eventually I got asked to go on staff as a, as a pastor. And I said, well, if I come on, I want to get this alpha course in, in the prison system. So I did that, got it going. And then Sandy Miller, my first vicar, said, I think we should get you trained up. And I, I very rudely said to him, there's not much training I need, actually. I was a staff sergeant in the army. I'm pretty, I'm pretty well trained. And he said, no, no, some biblical training. So I, I did a non-residential three-year degree and then came back to HTB, ordained as a vicar. Sounds weird even when I'm saying it myself, but yeah, I did. Amazing. But you've always had this kind of entrepreneurial thing in creatively looking at what you could do to impact either a prison or engaging community. That's always been you since faith, hasn't it, really? It has, really. But you're right, Roy, that, that line about since faith, because before that, you know, I, I did well in the military. I was a good soldier. I got awarded a few medals and things. But it was always kind of a struggle to try and be what I wanted to be. And then when I came to faith, you know, slowly, but when I came to faith, I just started to have these ideas. Maybe my background is this lad from this rough place in Manchester and this, this dodgy upbringing and the prison in my life, which I was always ashamed of. I felt God say to me, I'm going to use that and the military skills that you've got, and we're going to do this work together. But I didn't really know what it was. And then I had the idea of this alpha course. Goodness me, it's such an easy course to do, non-threatening. Even I can get through it. Maybe we should put that in the prison. Maybe the lads like me and women in prison might be able to get some hope and change like God did with me. So I started that in there. And then from there, really, they all kind of led on. I thought, well, actually, what are we going to do when they come out? Okay, well, I'm part of a church. I'll form a charity called Caring for Ex Offenders to help train churches who want to get involved in this work, to train them and to be able to take ex-offenders and integrate them back into society through the church. Working back from Alpha, they do an Alpha course, they want to change their life, they become a Christian. So the church can pick them up at the door. They needed mentoring, someone to have a chat with, so we started a mentoring service. Then a lot of them were homeless, so I did a homeless shelter. and a night shelter. So it all kind of led from that first encounter in the prison, really, all the different things that I've been involved with. Yeah, and I think it was also because you kind of saw the need and and thought, well, we've dealt with that bit, now we've got to deal with this bit. And so the journey of transformation that you took those people on, you realised that these things weren't in place, so you had to kind of find a way to put them in place. Is that right, Paul? Well, that's right, Roy. I mean, you know, it's a lot better now. It needs to be better, the justice system and the prison system. But it's better than it was. And, and actually, you're right. What, what I realized is they come out with no money. They come out unemployed. And they're just a recipe to go back into prison, which is the reoffending rates are ridiculous. That's why these things started to happen. I wasn't really 
thinking, oh, I'll start a debt counseling service. I just met Fred and Jimmy and Pete and they had no money and they had no sort of, you know, they couldn't get into the system. So that's how the debt counseling started. Then they were homeless. And I thought, well, we'll do, we'll do a night show. So it's just as the need ar- arose. And I had a brilliant church, you know, at HDB where they just let me get on with it and said, well, if that's what you want to do, go for it. As a result of that, is that how you got an honour from the Queen? Was that kind of all part of that process, Paul? Well, it was. That was that was a oh dear me. That was a shock. I was sat in my office about five o'clock at night at HTB, and they were bringing the mail round late at night, and they threw this letter on my desk. It was a photocopied, like a skew with photocopied sort of form, and it basically said, "You know, you've been nominated for an award by Her Majesty the Queen. If you want it, tick the box at the bottom." And I. And I, I don't know if anyone's listening who's got, who got one of these awards. And I thought, is this a joke? Anyway, I ticked it and threw it in the letterbox. It said, return it to this address. And it didn't say Buckingham Palace or anything. It was just a weird address. And I, and I sent it off and I thought nothing of it. And then I got another letter saying, you've been awarded um, an MBE for your services to ex-offenders. And... I, I couldn't believe it. Someone had nominated me, who I still don't know who it is, nominated me. And I ended up going to the, the palace to get to get this award. And the most exciting part of that for me was being, you know, all dressed up in your whatever you were dressed up in, in this great hall in the palace. And they announce over a speaker what your award's for, you know, for services to industry, for, for this, for that. For, mine was for working with men coming in and out of prison. And I thought, oh, come on. That's such a brilliant title in the palace. Brilliant. And obviously you were doing what you were doing, entrepreneurial, seeing a need, changing it. But there's been a massive change in your life in the last couple of months, Paul. Tell us about that story. Oh, goodness me. Well, you know, Rick Warren says that life is a mixture of battles and blessings. And he, he always says that they don't come at separate times, they run together. And I never quite understood what that meant. So for me, the battles and the blessings are, you know, I don't mind saying is um, Amanda, my wife, who I love dearly, has recently been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and and that, was, that was an overwhelming sort of thing that happened to us. And we weren't prepared for that and god willing it will be fine so that knocked me for six but at the same time that happened sir malcolm walker who's the founder of iceland the food retailers i knew him through a set of circumstances years ago and and out of the blue he rang me up for lunch and he said i want to get involved in in this work basically of getting men and women giving them a second chance and the long story short why i said well if you're serious that's my passion and he said, I am serious. Come and work for me. And and it was basically, it was that. I was offered a role over a coffee. Now I'm sat in this hotel room in Chester just after completing a day as a director of rehabilitation. So what does that mean for Iceland? I mean, there's nothing there at the moment. So you've got to be innovative and creative, haven't you, Paul? How's that going to work? Well, that's what I love, Roy. I love things. I love it when there's nothing on the table and you've got to try and build something. So what it is, it's a startup. They've employed me to get men and women out of prison into employment. So Iceland have a thousand stores, lots of warehouses and distribution centers, uh, lots of drivers needed. So my job is to recruit and get those men and women and give them a second chance on employment and get them into um, gainful employment. And obviously some of these guys, just the fact of getting up a regular time and Uh, going to a space, I mean, you've got some big challenges ahead of you, haven't you, Paul? Got some really big challenges. So I went to one prison and I I sort of pre-interviewed 15 men that were put forward out of those 15 i thought six were were serious and out of those six we've kind of offered three employment so it's a filter system you know men and women men especially in prison and we did that with a female prison as well out of six i interviewed four um we've offered positions 
uh, you know, when they're released, they're released over the next six months, all of them. But they've got some hope now of a job. Whether they can maintain it, you know, on the interview, that's what I say. Look, this is an open door for you. I don't care what you've done. The organization doesn't really care what you've done. We're looking at you at face value. This interview gets you a job if you want it. Whether you can keep it, then that's up to you. But a fantastic opportunity. And and I suppose the risk to the company, uh, there's an element of risk there, isn't there? Because just all of the issue, it's such an amazing opportunity that God's given you, Paul. You must feel that. I do. I feel a bit, you know, driving here after a day, I feel, I feel a bit overwhelmed. But actually, you know, the senior members of it, at its core, are profoundly um, sort of dedicated to want to do this work. You know, the, the, the social action, the, 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 the corporate responsibility. And, and you're right, they've got 40,000 staff. And my job's not to take over the position of HR or anything. I'm, I'm not doing any of that stuff. They've got an extraordinary team. And the person who leads it is amazing. So my, my role is to filter men and women into that pipe stream of employment. So you're right, Roy. It's a real God-given opportunity, which I hope I don't let him down. I think so many people, you know this anyway, coming out of prison, employment is the big challenge. They come out with a plastic bag, £18 in their pocket or whatever, and that's it. Whereas you're saying you could come out and walk into employment. I mean, Timpsons have been the leader in the in the market. You know, I've been meeting with them and learning from them some amazing, amazing things. They're equivalent to what I'm doing. Darren is is extraordinarily skilled and gifted at, at this stuff. So I've been learning for them, but you're absolutely right. So what they've got now, and actually it's hard for them to believe what I'm saying to them. So, you know, I said to one lad the other day, you have the opportunity to go into employment. You're released on Friday. You can be in a store on Tuesday. I won't tell you exactly what he said in the language, but he could not understand that he was given an opportunity. I said, no. He said, yeah, but you're not, you're not going to turn up. You're going to look at my previous conviction. I said, I've looked at everything. That's why you sat in front. They can't quite understand. You know the Proverbs, hope deferred makes the heart sick. They've lost hope in themselves. They've lost hope in society. And it's extraordinary to see their faces. It's such a privilege. Because some of these people could become managers and, you know, they could, if they get their chance, it, it's an amazing gift that you can give them. I, I just think God has placed you in that place at this time. And you, I'm, I'm sure you're still keeping the reverend. They've got a reverend as a director in Iceland. I know. I said to the owner, you know, he knows me very well. And I said, you are employing a reverend. You know that, don't you? He goes, yeah. I said, I am an ex-vicar. He goes, and? Oh, he's just a wonderful guy. Amazing. On the board meeting this morning, Sir Malcolm Walker introduced me as the Reverend Paul Cowley, Director of Rehabilitation. And it's just very odd to see people's faces. But then you start having, even today, Roy, I start having these conversations in the corridor. You know, oh, my mum was, was a Christian. Oh, my dad used to go. I think God's got more in store for people, as we know, than just getting men jobs in prison. Paul, we want to track this story and see how it does in, in the kind of development, because I think it's an amazing opportunity to see how this can come about. But anyone that's listening to this, I know it's been your journey, but in this season, to be offered this role, we never know from what we've developed, what we've looked at, but the relationship that you had with this director obviously has now flourished to where he trusts you and recognised that he should be doing this as an employer. It's just a fantastic opportunity, Paul. Is there anything you want to say as we kind of draw to a conclusion to anyone listening to this at this moment in time? Roy, well, yeah, I just I just think I think that would be brilliant to track it and see see what we do. Um, I think if anyone's listening, I, you know, I had I had possibly a couple of years left at HDB and I was really kind of enjoying myself. But if I'm honest, a little bit bored. And I remember my prayer was, Lord, I don't think I'm done yet, but I'm not sure what I could do. 
and, and honest, that was my prayer. You know, in other words, use me, Lord. I, I'm not sure what or if I can do anything. I can honestly say, Roy, three months ago, this didn't exist at all. So that's what's extraordinary. I know. It's been amazing, Paul. And when you told me that this was the new role and we talked and there was possibility to have a coffee to build it into the gospel entrepreneurs and how we can partner and all that, I just think it's fantastic that you're now in this space and the respect, credibility, and we pray blessing on you. It's so exciting. And obviously your wife healing for Amanda as well would be our prayer. But any final thing you want to say? I mean, I know you've said it. it, You never would have thought your prayer's been answered. Anything to anyone listening that may be struggling, thinking, hey, I'd love to do this. I see that. It's not happening for me, whatever. Roy, that, that, you know, in my my limited experience of of being a Christian and and knowing the Lord, I just think it's, I think it's really being honest. I think it's praying. And I think, you know, what's in my head is just say, use me, Lord. It, it might not be what you want to be used for, but it will be what he wants to be used for, which might be different. You may have to lay down your ideas. This was not my idea. I can honestly say that. But it's, it's just that we are not done with the Lord. When the world says that we're done, I think, that's the world saying that. So I would just say to anybody, you know, just just keep the hope, keep the prayer, uh, keep fellowship, and just just keep going with him because, you know, a thousand years is a day unto the Lord. So it's nothing for him to change our life. We just limit ourselves, and, and we shouldn't. And I'm still learning that now. We shouldn't limit ourselves. And Paul, the great thing is this role still fulfills your core passion. It, it's like it, it, it's still in you. And it's just giving you another space to step into, which is so exciting. I'm so excited. So thanks for listening, everybody. It's been great to share Paul's story on this special day when he's just started (laughs) as a new director in Iceland, director for transformation. So if you want any transformation, just contact the director for it. Uh, (laughs) Thanks, Roy. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> um, but we know another person who transformed you to enable that to happen, which is absolutely right. So, Jesus, we just are so grateful and we just pray blessing and favour. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing, Paul. And we look forward to being in touch with you again next week with someone else's greatest story. But thanks, Paul. Thanks, Roy. Have good favour and blessing in Iceland. God bless. Bye. Thank you, Paul, for joining me today. Paul's story and background is amazing. What he did just recently, praying, Lord, I'm not really got the same energy and enthusiasm. And then God opens a brand new opportunity to become a director at the highest level of this Iceland group. It's just an amazing miracle in this season. I hope you're inspired. And I hope you will reflect on Paul's story as you listen and reflect on your own story. I'll be back with another Gospel Entrepreneur next week. But in the meantime, you can catch up on all the previous conversations I've had on the UCB Player app or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening today. This is Gospel Entrepreneurs is a UCB podcast in partnership with Revelation Trust. Mm-hmm.